Okay. Can you hear me now? All right, sweet. Because <laughs> I can't hear you, John. I could just see you like just you know, gesturing towards me, kind of. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm really, really sad that I couldn't be there in person. Um, I had some crazy stuff go on here at home, so I'm kind of stuck in Ohio. Uh, and I was excited because this was going to be my first uh, Wild West that I could actually make it to. So I guess I'll have to wait until next year. Uh, so, you know, go have fun for me after this. So thank you for coming to the talk. Um, so far, I've not really been able to give this talk many places. It was scheduled for another conference that I didn't actually end up giving it at. Um, and I gave it an RSA, um, a little bit different version of it, but uh, pretty much the same same stuff. And, you know, not lots of people go there. So I wanted to uh, offer it up to you guys here, too, at, uh, at Wild West. So let's hope uh, you learned something about Sysmon today. So here we go. Love starting out a presentation like this, right? I'm sure this is a version of a story that a lot of you have heard. And if it's something that you've, you know, faced firsthand, you probably have stories to go along with it. So let's call this company Pass Grocery Store um, because this was an actual uh, compromise and it was in the food ish industry, right? Um, so my team was involved after a PS exec command ran over their VPN. So it caused an alert to fire and at the point where they just started to have servers become ransomware, which is definitely way, way later in the attack process than anyone would really uh, hope to detect an attack and pretty much too late in this specific case. So there's no sysmon installed and you'll find out why that's a big deal throughout the entire presentation. For some reason, their domain controllers have stopped sending Windows logs altogether. They aren't sending us any end endpoint agent logs, but that wouldn't have mattered because the domain controllers didn't have them anyways. Uh, the account that was used to send the PS exec command ended up being a shared admin user with their Pulse Secure VPN admin uh, account. So same, unit, same username, same password. Uh, that account had, yeah, locally and at, on, the, on the VPN had no multi-factor auth setup and had full domain admin and across the entire environment. So other than the lucky fact that the one endpoint that ended up receiving that PS exec command was sending us Windows logs, we would have been completely blind to pretty much all activity happening in that environment. It's really nice that the threat actors offered to give a discount for speedy turnaround. I believe they did end up having to pay the ransom because their backups were also not working for a significant amount of time and they needed the data on those servers to continue their day-to-day -day operations. Sadly, it's just one of those cases where you can't lead a horse's logs to water until its servers have been ransomware. I don't think that's how it goes, but it's something like that. As defenders, above and beyond, above and beyond all of the other roles that we play, like what strategic thinking, process creation, research, one of the main goals that we have no matter what vertical we're in uh, is defending its uh, defending against threats right there's entire conferences like this one uh companies frameworks you name it built around built around those three words prior to 2014 um all antivirus uh endpoint antivirus products were pretty much just looking for the uh, detection of md5 hashes right so just plain virus signatures most part did the bulk of the work and back then in 2014 the amount of things on the internet and on networks in general paled to com in comparison is what we have today so what what do we rely on now advanced machine learning artificial intelligence boxes or maybe just waiting until uh, you know you have that splash page about your uh, server being encrypted but you know as as our enterprise networks have grown hopefully matured uh, the majority of what we see now are largely misconfigured or underconfigured endpoint security products that cost upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, there's this repeated behavior of just kind of throwing money at a problem uh, and hoping this new blinky box or piece of software is going to automatically fix uh, everything without the continuous thought improvement, configuration, whatever. I've been in the industry now for going on 15 years, which makes me feel really super old. 
And I'm sure I don't have to tell any of you either that when it comes to a lot of different environments, sadly, that's still the mindset. Now, don't get me wrong with staff, time, money, knowledge, all of those implementations can run smoothly. Um, and, you know, a lot of them have their, their pros and cons, but they're, they're still going to be able to run smoothly with the, like the thought and effort put behind it um, to both detect and defend against a, a whole lot of different attacks, right? But a lot of times organizations don't have those benefits, right? So I'm here to talk about super powerful option that's not only free, but I can tell you anyone that works in the IR space are, is going to consider you a hero for implementing it as early as possible as when something does happen and you know you, you have to look into uh you know a breach or attack or, or whatever you're gonna not have to be blinded to uh what's actually going on how can we make sure that uh your endpoint operating systems are giving you the biggest bang for your buck especially when that buck's free sysmon's here kind of to save the day so i threw the microsoft definition up here just in case anyone wants a refresher uh, it was released by Microsoft in 2014 as a part of the Sys internal suite of products. And ever since then, server admins and security practitioners have been perplexed as to why it's just not included by default. Granted, you know, it, it does cause issues sometimes with slower, uh, slower devices, but still, you know, you can kind of consider it the incredible Hulk version of Windows logging when it comes to the enhancements uh, and information that it provides you. You can consider it maybe like the smart hulk the smart hulk though like from smart hulk or inverse end game i think we're going to go ahead and cover some use cases um that kind of paint the picture of all that advanced information sysmon can give us uh, i'm not going to cover all of it because there's a whole lot um but we'll we'll go into some specific use cases and then show you what you can do to create meaningful detections around some of this stuff and then also some threat hunting um, and examples of uh, logs detecting malicious activity in the wild. This is from the 2020 CISO security priority study. You know, enterprises and orgs have a lot on their plates these days um, in regards to cybersecurity. There's been a huge and quick adoption to move to cloud and mobile technologies. And with the last, what, two, three years of having more and more and more people work from home, the attack surface has just significantly expanded. So according to this study, it said 31% of respondents believe that their risk response efforts are underfunded and 38 reporting they're gonna be spending more money on response planning. Now, how many of those 38% do you imagine have Sysmon already configured? Going based on our customer average, we see single digit percentages of people that come to us wanting a SIM and don't have Sysmon installed already. So that's why it's just included in our onboarding process. Because again, the cost of Sysmon is exactly $0. I'm a huge proponent of using the tools at your disposal, you know, open source and free if you have the ability to, because as practitioners, we have this responsibility to help the organization realize that there's viable options out there prior to asking for capital expenditures, especially when you want those, those expenditures to go further. Why not, you know, do what you can with what you have. You know, for those of you in the audience with purchasing power or influence, wouldn't you want to see that other avenues were being taken to further that infrastructure security before even entertaining ideas? purchasing new stuff like granted if it's like apples and oranges sure like it totally makes sense but if you have something like this that's that's available and free like why not because if you can reduce your uh time to detection time to remediation with that price tag but with that price tag why not so i'm not one to read slides uh but this quote i think should be repeated maybe it would make a better tattoo well, probably not because it's kind of longer uh, but I plan on getting a live, laugh, log tattoo. I might just stick with that one. <laughs> but uh, quick detection and response are critical to reporting the exact scope of a breach, figuring out what might have been compromised, and complying with regulatory breach notification requirements. So at any point when you have an incident and you already have Sysmon installed, configured, logging centrally, all the stuff that you need to have, you're going to find be able to find your breach scope, unless you know you have other things other than Windows, all that kind of stuff. But for Windows-based stuff, 
keep me on track. I'm sure you've uh, heard the uh, phrase, assume you've been breached when either designing or implementing security software program, whatever. And fundamentally, when you hear that, like, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Like, what am I selling you? <laughs> Duh, obviously, good luck proving a negative. Well, I am not a good salesperson, so I'm not here to sell you anything. Um, you know, that's, that's, I would not do great in, in any, any kind of sales roles. I'm, I'm way too honest. <laughs> so let's move on to Sysmon, some uh, Sysmon specifics. Here are some of the specific benefits that we can get from Sysmon. So if you're beginning a hunt, uh, more than likely you're inserting yourself into an event related to a Windows host that is either in the process of happening or maybe as a retroactive step to find threat activity that you've missed. In either one of those situations, Sysmon logs are going to give you, by default, an amazing amount of logs compared to anything just plain Windows can provide, even when fully configured. So, and honestly, sometimes way better information than a hand, handful of endpoint solutions. Here you see the differences in uh, Windows event IDs compared to Sysmon. So there's 10 different uh, types of data that fail to even appear without using Sysmon. And there's others, while they're possible, are incredibly difficult to configure and still lack information comparative to what Sysmon does give you. I can tell you that after attempting several times to get standard uh, Windows domain controllers to log DNS properly at debug level, uh, it's way easier to just install Sysmon. It gives you more information and it doesn't you know, kill your DNS resolution. So for threat hunting, what can we do with this information? One good method is a lot uh, something that a lot of us normally just do and take for granted, and that's using standard deviation to weed out uh, baseline activity. So standard standard deviation is a measure of how dispersed the data is in relation to the mean. So in this example graph, uh, about ninety percent of the results lie between that one and a half and you know negative one and a half um, standard deviation, and so the rest we can call outliers. That can be helpful in threat detection and research in a multitude of ways. So looking at those outliers regularly can give you a good look at some of the less common activities that are happening in the environment. Here we take an example of some Sysmon logs, and I'll, I'll zoom in on this in a second, and view it over time for all of our customers. The y-axis on the left, we see total destinations starting at 50, going up through most of the results in the 500 to 5 million range. The x-axis shows the standard deviation score starting at 2. In this exercise, we're taking all across all customers, all Sysmon process names across our entire customer data set, which is why those numbers are so large, and looking at the destination IP address they're accessing and you know, calculating a standard deviation to see if we can find anything interesting. Granted, you always have to take this kind of stuff with a grain of salt. Imagine this graph, but if you had a process running from an attacker over the last six months that was never caught, maybe your standard deviation you know, is spread out over an entire year, and that process ends up in your baseline, and it wouldn't end up at a far end of, you know, graph either upwards or, or uh, on x-axis or the y-axis, and have the ability to kind of stick out for the threat hunting that you're actually in the process of. So we're going to zoom in on this. There we go. So get it, zoom in. I had to pick the first one, right? So we see Zoom, we see Teams, we see Java, Chrome, um, all things that you know are going to reach out to a million different IP addresses. Edge, go to meeting, Cisco WebEx. There's Ring Central. There's an email server, and then we see Notepad reaching out to you know some two million IP addresses on the internet. Uh, I think our lab definitely had something to do with that uh, because you know you take the lab data out, and Notepad doesn't reach out to any IP addresses, which is great. But it kind of gives you an example of what you can use uh, to kind of, you know, search, search stuff like that. And it's just one of the several different ways you can come up with it, detection ideas in, in not just across, you know, hundreds of customers, but also more specific to threat scenarios in uh, organizations. Uh, another uh, main detection creation strategy that we use is adversary emulation. One of the main tools that we use at our, dis our disposal is also free is uh, Vector. So you can find this at vector.io. It's V-E-C-T-R.io. And you can import several different frameworks into this tool. Um, I'll give you a few examples of what we use when we started down our journey of creating Sysmon detections at Blue Marrow. 
Here you can see the heat map of the MITRE ATT&CK framework imported into Vector. And the next couple slides, I'll dive deeper into those. If you spend much time in either the ATT&CK framework or Atomic Red Team, especially looking at what detections to create and what to map those to, it's a hugely daunting task, especially you know when, when there's just so much out there. But this application makes it really act, uh, easy to track your progress. I'm a huge advocate of detection testing, whether you use a framework like this or have other use cases that you want to ensure are caught by your sim. You know, it makes sense that testing those is a big uh, portion of my team's job because we're the ones creating them. But also, like from a customer's perspective, or perspective or your perspective, whatever. Whether you have a managed sim, whether you do it internally, uh, my favorite kind of customer is one that's going to test uh, all of my detections to see if they can get around them. Right. So it's it's uh, definitely something that you should add to your like I don't know uh, uh, security plan. So if we dive a little bit deeper into specific one of those techniques, uh, there's a few sets of information. So first you see the red team portion of the technique. Vector does a really good job of separating them out into different uh, fields. So uh, this is the atomic red team test. It gives you the name, the description, even in the operator guidance, it tells you uh, what you can run. And then it also points out that this has been used by TrickBot malware. Right? It's a great place to start if you don't have a dedicated internal purple or red team. And you want to keep in mind, too, that some of these might be caught by other endpoint security software. Right. So maybe Windows Defender or if you have a full blown endpoint software that you use. Right. But if we think back to that first use case, you know, you want to also test outside those bounds and see if, you know, if that endpoint software isn't installed, can you still detect on this? Right. So we're, we're trying it at different layers. On that same technique page, they offer a section for blue team details. And here's where you can track the status of the detection in your organization. So any other notes you have, like, what the severity is, if it was detected or not. Whenever we uh, would use this to create a new syspon detection, we perform those red team guidance on that, like the last page and anything else that we may find uh, regarding the tech. And then, you know, you can save your query and whatever sim you use in that uh, outcome notes. All right. So now you've covered how organization can create and test different detections. So let's dive into some specific use cases. There's a ton of different ways that process memory can be extracted from a Windows endpoint. Sure, you can run Mimikatz locally, but you can also gain access to these hashes a multitude of different discrete ways. So here you can see that you can use COM services DLL, which is a built-in COM plus service that was introduced um, uh, during Windows XP. And you can leverage that to extract local hashes. So there's a handful of detections that technically are considered finishing moves meaning the attacker has keys to the kingdom, the security team's lives have just gotten way harder than they ever wanted. This isn't necessarily that game ending move, but it does mean that an attacker has local access to a machine and the files in their possession that potentially have admin credentials to your devices. So this should definitely be considered a priority one threat, meaning that you know immediate action should be taken. Just as a note, and going through these, I've blurred out any information that's like customer related. So you're not really missing out on anything, but like usernames and computer names and IP addresses and stuff, um, unless I've re-performed the test in the lab. So I've taken some of the stuff that's been caught, performed it in the lab. That way you can see the full command without, you know, stuff blocked out. So here we see the exact command and timestamp on the device in question. So services.dll exports a function called mini dump. You see here it uses run32 to call con services, the mini dump command, the process ID, where to save the memory dump, and then the keyword full. And then also there's some other related findings which happen around the same period of time on that device. I apologize in, in advance for all of the screenshots of Event Viewer. You don't have to have, you know, uh, a quiz at the end because I'm not there. So, you know, just count yourself lucky. I guess if you really want a quiz, I can give it to you in Discord. <laughs> but here's where we see the huge differences in the native Windows logging compared to a configured Sysmon install. Even if you can't make out all the specific differences in the logs themselves, you can see just like from a sheer volume of information, and I'll zoom in on like our slides, that uh, Windows Event ID 4688 on the left fails into comparison with the information that event ID 1 for process creation on the right is. Note that 
you know, even the reason that 4688 even shows up as a log, that you have to do two separate things in group policy to configure the output of those results. You have to do turn on command line logging and process creation have to be enabled for that to even show up. So items to note in this event ID one on the right, it gives you the rule name taken from the sysmon config that it triggered on. It gives you different information that can be correlated to other activity, like the process ID, the terminal session ID, because I was already peed into our lab when I generated it, hashes of the file, and then more information on the parent process. In the previous slide, it showed uh, like the MITRE technique listed as, as the as the rule name, so you can see that a little bit better here, uh, and we can correlate that to a few different things. Uh, we recommend using Sysmon modular config. A lot of people use that or the Swift on Security uh, config for Sysmon. Uh, Sysmon modular gives you a little bit more context. It actually maps these to MITRE and that uh, the second screenshot is uh, where you can see it in the actual configuration uh, for Sysmon. And then that bottom one is the corresponding atomic red team test that you can use to uh, trigger that detection or create logs for it, right? Our use case one in summary shows how we can use that Sysmon event ID one to capture how comm services is dumping hashes for an attacker to crack. That's kind of a little bit what the detection looks like. So you're looking for that Windows event ID one. And if your command or your parent command looks like something with comm services and mini dump, nice, short and simple. And then, you know, now we can move on to some more in-depth use cases and more event viewer screenshots. <laughs> so this is an example of one of those finishing moves that I was talking about. Again, something you'd want to know as soon as possible. So NTDS util, it's a built-in Microsoft utility that's used for managing Active Directory. It's been used for many, many years by uh, admins just to perform functions against Active Directory. But it can actually also be used by threat actors to dump the ntds.dit file. So that's the actual database where all of your Active Directory user information and forest information is stored, uh, which you don't, you know, you don't want just random people having. That backup's created so the threat actor can kind of just exfil it and then get to work cracking all of the passwords from the Active Directory Forest. Now, if anybody has had to either follow the Microsoft Guide on Network Eviction Process or start a forest, a forest over from scratch or just like manually migrate all your clients to the cloud uh, after something like this has happened, uh, I'd love to hear your stories. Funny enough, when I, when I gave this at RSA, I asked that question, I'm like, I'd ask you to raise your hands, but I can't see anybody. So like that question kind of, you know, goes out, out the window. Um, but I asked people in the audience, like, hey, have you ever been through that kind of you know, network eviction process? And, like a couple of people raised their hands and one of them came up to me afterwards and talked to me. He's like, oh, yeah, like I was one of the like 10 people that wrote that. And I'm like, oh, holy crap. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, and he, he kind of agreed that most people just move to the cloud now instead of doing network eviction. Here you can see in the matched evidence portion a little bit more information. It again blocked out because, you know, customers. But the important part is the command. Uh, so we're looking for NTDS util to run a backup. You see uh, ACI NTDS, which sets it as the active instance. IFM creates installation media and uh, like for you know read-only domain controllers and, and all that kind of stuff. And then the backups created. Uh, the two queues are just for quitting the previous two commands. And that just gives you a nice download of Active Directory information to go crack. Here are the differences between the two types of event IDs again, with really on the left-hand side, just a large list of 4799s, which is a new enumerating Active Directory. That's just how Active Directory works. Groups and user, they're, they're enumerated all the time, right? It's really difficult to just trigger based on that, just because that's like, it's a feature, it's not a bug. So 4688 was also generated, but we kind of covered that in the first use case. Let's take a look at the other ones. Uh, on the right hand side, you see a huge wall of tiny text uh, with the amount of information you're about, you're we're able to gather when that command is run using Sysmon. So let's move on so we can see it a little closer. There we go. You can see event ID one a little closer up. Um, this is comparable to that use case one that we went over. So you can see NTDS util is the original file name, the command that was run from the parent image of PowerShell. And this event 
gives extended information about that newly created process. When the command was run, uh, the full command line context, right, on all of that. And now with this attack, we have other event ideas to look at as well, and we can use those to correlate. Here is the first place where we see event ID 10, uh, which is for a process being accessed. And it's one of the 10 events that isn't included with Windows, no matter what you configure. And we see that the source of uh, source image of PowerShell is being used to open up MTDS Util, which leads us to event ID 13 of a registry value being set. So this event populates whenever that process executes successfully. Again, we see the detection screen with what, with what you can look for as far as detection goes. And then NTDS, you know, like I said, it can be used legitimately across an environment for sysadmins, but it's extremely rare. So you can look for event ID 1, a process name of NTDS util, or including um, NTDS util, and a couple different things in the command or the parent command. This one, this example is just those two Q commands quitting. You can also do like, you know, followed by IFM or, or whatever. Like there's a bunch of different options that you can do there. All right. So use case number three. This is another priority one threat. And this is ComSpec modifying the registry. On the bottom there, you can see that ComSpec is the environment variable that can open the command line. So I just did echo ComSpec. It's really just cmd.exe. You can't really see exactly what's going on here from the de description of the command itself because it has been base64 encoded. But using a conspe comspec environment variable along with a hidden and encoded PowerShell command is incredibly sketchy. We've not seen a false positive yet on this type of behavior. I say yet because there is an amazing amount of software used in production that likes to mimic threat actor activity. Have you ever if you've ever implemented a SIM or tuned a SIM or created detections, whatever, you all, you know, you know that there is just bad software out there, like so, so many software packages that just do pass the hash on the background. So, so, so terrible. So this is a perfect example in a short sidebar. When I was looking for data for this talk, I was weeding through some PowerShell commands and noticed something really, really weird. So normally when you see words in upper and lower case, you just assume it's some sort of obfuscation technique. So I took the base 64, decoded it, and found it was Matt Graber's reflection method, which is an AMSI by bypass. So right away, I started to worry. Just look at seeing all of this really weird process execution with all of these red team tools encoded in PowerShell. Turns out uh, it's actually a pretty popular security product It for some reason runs these through their application. Uh, assuming it's some sort of detection or like active tests that they run on the endpoint agent. But when you start to dig into the process creation and the encoded commands and everything, it starts to get really, really interesting. So back to the use case at hand. Here you can see that ComSpec is being called to run PowerShell and install it as a service on the endpoint. Like I said, I gave this at RSA, so uh, I had to customize, you know, the service for the purpose of the, for the presentation. Uh, if I would have had time, I would have customized it for while I was hacking fest, uh, or just like, I don't know, use paint, put a logo on there, I don't know. Uh, so you have a sneaky way of calling the command line, followed by uh, no profile, hidden encoded PowerShell command. And so if you if you have any interest diving deeper on this, I have a note in here that FireEye has a really good white paper called Exploring the Depths of CMD Obfuscation and Detection Techniques, which is very, very long, but uh, kind of an interesting read. So I've already showed you one in 13. So let's dive into the specifics of event ID 8 and also on to 10. So most true positive process injection attempts you can find in both of these sysmon event IDs. Here we see create remote thread detected. This is another one that you don't have the ability to see with any plain Windows log. It lets you know that PowerShell has injected code into DLL host, and you can see that the source process is PowerShell and the target image of uh, DLL host. And the second uh, sysmon event that shows some process injection is 10. This reports when a process opens another process. 
So an operation that's usually followed by like information queries, reading and writing the address space. During this attack in the lab, there were a whole bunch of event IDs uh, generated because the command that was run was attempting to inject into all of the processes. So again, this is lab data. So that shown encoded command isn't really the same. We'll go back to the detection in the customer logs and see what that encoded command is actually doing. Take that encoded command from the logs I had, which is base64 encoded. Decode that, no problem. You know, there's a million websites out there that you can decode it or you can use command line, whatever. Uh, I see it's double encoded then or something, right? Because you see a new object, you see from base64 and the string there on the left hand on the bottom. And I'm trying to decode that didn't work, but it turned out it was a base64 encoded gzip file. So decompressed, decoded that, and then we got this. That's the method that Cobalt Strike uses to avoid detection. Uh, it opens up space in memory so it can inject shellcode into already taken space. Luckily, this was detected right away and the customer was able to remediate in a very short amount of time, not leading to, you know, full blown compromise where they find they have no backups and stuff. Also, another really funny story when you try and get your talks reviewed before giving them and just send Cobalt Strike code in keynote files, lots of endpoint agents don't like that. And then you don't get your talk reviewed. <laughs> so in summary, for the third use case, we see the method of detection using those uh, sysmon event logs 12 and 13 of that registry uh, key being set or created. And then the command or parent command line with the environment variable of Comspec. Like I said, there's also 8 and 10 in those Windows event IDs. There's a lot of different detection capabilities uh, surrounding, you know, four different uh, Windows uh, event logs with this one. So now that you're all a little bit familiar, hopefully learned something with different event IDs in Sysmon, let's do it all together and tie it together in like a customer exchange compromise, which great timing because now there's even more exchange compromises that are out there uh, as of last week. I'm not going to replay it in the lab and make you look at 100 event viewer, event viewer screenshots. The proxy logon that happened, that was in, back in the beginning of 2021. And now we have the new one that's happened. Um, if you want to learn more about it, you can go to proxylogon.com, which is kind of shown here. It gives you like full information on the vulnerability exploit, IOCs, all kinds of stuff. But the gist is, it's a vulnerability in exchange that allows an attacker to bypass auth and impersonate as the admin. So as a result, unauthenticated attacker can execute commands on a Microsoft Exchange server through port 443, which is, you know, terrible. So not, not too long ago, had a customer come to us and ask for help around a notification they received about two different MSI files being run and installed on their Exchange server and other commands that were being run that they didn't think should be happening. They actually had 11 different related findings around that same activity. And so the next several slides, I don't have all 11 of them, but the next several slides you'll see in rapid succession. First, we see something along the same lines as that process injection we talked about in the other use cases. So we have PowerShell being run on an exchange server, injecting into spawning uh, DLL host, Acting alone with no other context, sure, this could be on a random endpoint with maybe something sketchy, but not necessarily horrible happening. But then the next detection we see fire is a command being run of netgroup dom domain admins, which is a command you use to find all the domain admins in the current domain. Now again, run alone, this could just be like an admin doing admin things. Those commands are definitely there for a reason, just like NTD as util and can be used for their intended purposes, but you don't super come and see people via the command line getting a list of current domain admins super often. So pieces are starting to fit together, especially when you have a small group of people more than likely run all, in, all of the technology and security in the whole company. And then here adds a little bit more suspect activity. Why would somebody be mounting the C drive of the domain controller to the exchange server? Again, maybe not the best activity from an admin, but sometimes it happens, right? If you've ever been an admin, you got to get, you have to get files from point A to point B, and it's fast and easy. 
especially, you know, you're one of the few people doing it, you'll fix it later, whatever. But when you have like the people looking over their shoulder being like, hey, uh, is this you? <laughs> and it not being, you know, the panic kind of starts to set in. I know we talked a little bit about the PowerShell encoded commands. But here you, you see something on top of that, which happens to be in malicious PowerShell activity all the time, which is the .NET web client download. So that bottom ish, you know, portion, the new object net dot web client download string. So it's a small piece of code that can call and execute something from the internet uh, fairly easily. And then finally, we can see uh, that the IIS web service process spawning another child process. So in this case, IIS web service spawned PowerShell, and that's ex that's associated with the full uh, exchange proxy log on compromise itself. Unfortunately, uh, this turned into a full incident response investigation, but without that use of Sysmon, who knows how long it would have taken to see that compromise uh, with the information that you need out of, out of Sysmon. I know that was a lot, but one of the detections that we can see for that exchange compromise is one of the IOCs itself. So where you have Windows event ID 1, the parent process name is that IIS web service process, and it's I mean, literally spawning anything, right? Like that IIS process shouldn't be spawning, especially PowerShell and command line. But yeah, like def definitely bad news there. All right, so time to rip off your blindfold uh, and maybe save yourself some money. So some immediate steps that you can take here, scrutinize your logs, you know, do kind of a gap analysis and see the quality of your logging. Uh, do you have Sysmon installed where you can? What tool are you using? Is it right for your environment? Are you getting the right information? Maybe you have a lack of logs. Are all of your critical logs or the critical devices um, set to log the necessary information? Right. If you don't don't have it logging process creation or anything like that on an, on an exchange server that's on the internet, how are you going to ever detect or, or respond to that incident? After you have all that information gathered, you should have some sort of process of improvement plan. So a lot of times that can align with your department specific or your you know company objectives. Uh, sometimes it covers both. You know maybe that process process of improvement includes installing Sysmon everywhere, right? I know you're all going to run home and go do that. Uh, maybe it's a change in your config. Maybe you found out it's not logging or not creating event ID one, and that's you know one that you really really want. Maybe it's taking the steps to getting a SIM or installing one or, or working with third party, whatever, um, or testing your own. Um, something that we have um, that we offer uh, out there for free. Uh, technically, we use it for our customers, but you can, you know, use it for pretty much anything. Uh, so, you know, uh, sending logs right away. So basically, what we we're finding was difficult was when customers want to implement a SIM and, and, and log other stuff, trying to install Sysmon and NX log everywhere pre presents a lot of unique challenges. Not every endpoint is the same. You don't want the same logs off of every endpoint. You don't have the same logs off of every endpoint. And if you've ever worked with NX log, which is the um, which is one of the you know handful of softwares that actually take event viewer logs and ship them somewhere else. Uh, the community edition, which is free, uh, breaks if anything in the configuration is off. So for, you know, in the beginning, we were trying to do this manually. We're like, oh, it's an Active Directory server, so we need, like, these event viewer channels. Or this is an IIS server, so we need this event viewer channel. Uh, that's super tedious and terrible. So instead, we uh, created what's called Poshim. So what this does is it automatically installs and configures Sysmon and NXLog and dynamically generates the configuration for them. So it'll pull down the, the Sysmon modular config. It will only add the event channels that uh, are actually on the device. And you just have to put in the IP address of where you're going to ship the logs to. So if you can use it, feel free. Um, we found uh, a, lot, a lot of use out of it so far. Something else that you should do, several different times uh, you saw like the different enrichments that Sysmon Modular gave. Both of these configs are great, right? Definitely used for different reasons. Uh, I highly recommend checking them both out. The beauty of 
uh, system on modular is you can like pick and choose like different things that you may want to turn on. And yeah, they're, they're both really, really popular Sysmon configs. And then also test your SAM. So highly, highly, highly recommend you begin an active relationship with your SIM, whether it's a vendor or in-house. You need some sort of regular verification that common attacks are detected, right? So many different things can go wrong to make a detection break. If you think about it, like maybe a uh, firewall rule got put into place that's blocking ports or parsing isn't working correctly anymore or an agent has stopped, or like there's just like a mil not millions probably, but lots of different things that can break detections. Maybe there's a new attack out there that runs a, li a little bit different way than from what you were detecting before. So test, you know, obviously you're not gonna be able to test everything everywhere all the time because, you know, that's, that's more than a full team, right? Um, but, you know, do it more than just yearly and tests, right? You know, some of these things are, are, are easy tests you can do. There's some uh, password spraying uh, tests that that are out there. Uh, you can do like PowerShell dropper attack. And then I go into a handful of different things in a, in a webinar that I'm pretty sure that link still works. If not, let me know. And then last but not least, give Vector and Red Canary a try. It's a really good way to map those detections to a comprehensive framework. And that's it. So in summary, we face threats every day, new threats, different kinds of threats, different ways of people threading, um, and they're never going to decrease. So, you know, we see that Sysmon uh, can be used not just as active detection, but also for in-depth threat hunting and, you know, all the variety of configurations options you have. So it can give you really good visibility into each layer of an attacker's actions. So I want to thank my entire team at Blue Mirror for everything they do. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm really still, again, really, really sad I couldn't be there in person. So, you know, if you ever want to visit me in Ohio, feel free. It's kind of terrible outside. But um, yeah, I hope you learned something new on how Sysmon can help in your environment. And yeah, thanks and have an awesome con.